Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nordbank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, SJP Properties, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, Greenberg Traurig LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from Arbor Realty Trust and Terry's Investment Partners, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Metal Products, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal & Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sydney Fetner Associates, Sutfin Properties, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, Triangle Services, Whitkoff Group, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction. Hello, my name is Michael Stowe, host of Building New York. You know, there are people who are builders of New York, and then there are people who are truly builders of New York. And, you know, as many of my people know from my shows, there are certain regulars. And the regular that I have is a builder of New York. The Charles Nelson Riley of the Stoller Report is here today. I'm very happy to have David Kramer, a principal of the Hudson Companies, here. Thank you, Michael. That's my line. That's your line. That's your line. I'm a regular. You're a regular. You truly are a regular, but you're not a regular in building New York. But, I mean, the Hudson Companies has over, done over a billion dollars of construction. So let's talk about this 42-year-old kid who's born in Mount Sinai Hospital who grows up on the Upper West Side. But that's, that's the, the initial thing, 42. All true. Now, Tell me a little bit about your, your father. You're telling me about your, your father was one of four brothers? Uh, two brothers, two sisters, born in Bensonhurst on 86th Street. Uh, grew up to, um, with an Orthodox Jewish family. Um, uh, don't forget Uncle Sammy. <laughs> his Uncle Sam, my great Uncle Sam. Legend had it that my great Uncle Sam was responsible for bringing the Lubavitcher Rebbe over from Poland. That's the great rabbi who's now on Eastern Parkway. And I always thought of it as one of these family urban myths until somebody once called me up and they said, you know, I heard you say that and I have this book in front of me and it's about how American Jews brought the Lubavitcher Rebbe over from Poland and your great uncle's name, Sam Kramer, is all over this book. He really was the guy. So they sent me the book and now I can say, you know, with more verification that I come from a family where... You know, we you have, brought over the Lubavitcher Rebbe. We brought over the Lubavitcher Rebbe. So we got, we know, got the, that the, going the for us. The interesting story that you said when we met the other day is your dad, uh, his brothers probably went to Yeshiva University, and at being going to Yeshiva University, they didn't have to go into the draft. Your father went to Brooklyn College, which we're very happy because of the city university, and your father gets drafted and he goes to Germany. And what happens? Well, my father was, you know, what was not a. Um, was not a, a, a true believer in Orthodox Judaism. Um, instead of going the, the route to yeshiva, he goes to Brooklyn College. He's drafted and as an 18-year-old um, on the battlefields of Germany after um, two or three weeks as a private, um, he was injured. He lost his arms um, in Germany. He was a, um, a bilateral arm amputee. And the quick family story is that there was shrapnel that exploded. It injured him. He's basically bleeding to death on the battlefields of Germany. And one of the medics who's coming through, performing triage, trying to figure out who's going to live and who to save and who not to save, comes upon him, um, sees, um, sees his name and his name tag, 
um, you know, he's basically unrecognizable from, from the injury, and realizes that it's his best friend's younger brother from, from Brooklyn. And he looks at him and he says, Meishi, what are you doing here? And my father looks up in a half um, fog at his older brother's best friend, Harold Goldberg, the medic, and neither of them knew that the other was in that part of Germany. And he says, waiting for the Avenue D bus, passes out, Harold Goldberg takes him and basically saves his life by taking him um, for you know, immediate, um, immediate help. He doesn't plead to death, and he grows up as a disabled American veteran. Now, your father comes back, uh, goes back to Brooklyn College, goes to University of Denver Law School? University of Colorado. Colorado Law School. Comes back to New York, gets married. Your mother is a social worker for the Jewish Board for Family Services for the last 45 years. And you, um, you and your brother move and you live on the west side in a rent-stabilized apartment, which is perfect because you're in an affordable housing business that you've built over there. And you, over here, go to Collegiate, an interesting place for you. It's a great place. No, well, that was, that was a quick 40-year summary <laughs> since from the battlefields of Germany. But yes, I grew up on the Upper West Side. Uh, you know, my father was uh, from uh, Brooklyn. My mother went to Queens College. And so for them, you know, making it to Manhattan and being on the Upper West Side was, you know, as good as life. We, we got to get the as map As good there. as life offers on West 86th Street. Uh, and I went to uh, Collegiate School for Boys, one of the great, great institutions uh, and in now, the country. Now, your father passed on when you were 16 years of age, and you decide to go to Yale. And at Yale, most people want to be pre-med, they want to go pre-law. What does David Kramer want to do? I was the only one who didn't actually have any interest in going to graduate school. Most of my uh, classmates... Was it because, was Sudoku in business at that time? <laughs> we'll get to that later on in the show. <laughs> my, Sudoku, my Sudoku competition? Um, no, I wasn't, I wasn't planning on a career in Sudoku at the time. But most of my classmates were, um, I think, had their eye on, uh, on law school. Uh, medical school, business school, some type of graduate school. Um, so since I wasn't so focused on graduate school, I think I could be a little more relaxed about my academic achievements at Yale. Right, um, but you had no idea of real estate. I mean, no. one, one summer you, uh, you went to Israel uh, and you nearly got uh, picked up by Asha Torah. That's uh, right. I see. And, and then mm -hmm. one summer you were a bartender. Uh, and I so saw you the world. were well prepared for the world of real estate. Though. I don't know about that. I was, uh, I was just living life and having fun as, uh, as, as a 20-year-old. And uh, if, if I got involved in anything um, real estate-wise at Yale, it was on homelessness and issues of homeless policy that just began in the, in the mid-'80s um, and uh, working for a New Haven nonprofit on homeless issues. That was the closest I got to, to real you estate. You graduate Yale. You're what, 22? Yeah. 22. And all of a sudden, what, you didn't like New York? You, you had to leave New York City, and you wanted to go out to California? You wanted to be in Venice and Malibu? What, what happens? So, um, I applied for a fellowship with the Coro Foundation. Coro runs um, training programs in public affairs, and it's a way to understand the world and experience the world in a nine-month fellowship working in different assignments. And they sent me to L.A., and I thought, I'll go to L.A. for one year. I'll do this Coro Foundation Fellowship, and then I'll come now, back. Now, what, what did you do in the one-year fellowship? I mean, what, what was the, you told me you built hotels. You built I built other, hotels, yeah, <laughs> as a 22-year-old. Now you spend a month in a different assignment in Coro, uh, and you see the world, you, you spend an assignment with a nonprofit, with a, with a government agency, you work on a campaign, uh, and so I worked for, I worked for Parks Group, I worked for a real estate developer, I worked for a hotel and restaurant workers union. Um, I worked for um, you know different nonprofits group. I worked for an educational nonprofit. So it's a good way to see all the different um, types of um, fields out there. It, it, it's a good program for people just leaving college who are interested in the world of public affairs, broadly defined, and it helps sort of help me figure out you know some some career goals. <laughs> So now you're 23. What, what do you so do? So what now? What do I do? I'm 23. What do you, what do, you do? I, I mean, I mean, you you you're a tutor at Stanley Kaplan's, uh, you know, Kaplan courses. You you know, what, what I'm do you all set do? up to be a great generalist at great that generalist. point. I've I've wor I've created math problems for Stanley Kaplan, and I've, uh, um, you know, helped uh, helped leaflet with the hotel and restaurant workers union. And there were th really three careers that interested me at that time. I'm I'm a 23 year old. I'm I'm really focused on the nonprofit world. Um, I want to um, save the world, 
and uh, the three uh, fields are education, and I'm thinking that would be interesting to go into education one day, be the principal of a, of a school. Um, and I was thinking about city government. Um, my father's last job had been as um, corporation counsel in the city of Long Beach on Long Island. And in California, there are a lot of um, uh, city managers who are um, p uh, appointed professionals. And I thought that um, city government was an interesting field. And then I thought of affordable housing. And in the late 80s, affordable housing was really taking off. There were more and more um, community-based nonprofits um, being created, uh, being funded by the 1986 tax credit legislation by a lot more city and state subsidies. And they were hiring and they were you know, doing projects. So, so somebody made the decision to hire you to be the project manager at the Skid Row Housing? So I talked my way into a project management job at the Skid Row Housing Trust. In the interview, they asked me, um, do you know how to use an HP-12C? Now, for my a, audience, that's a, yes. that's a... That's a real estate calculator. It's a financial calculator. And I said, of course I know how to use an HP-12. C? <laughs> and right after the interview, I ran out, I got my HP 12C, I read the instructions. It's not that complicated, and to this day, I still have that same calculator. And, um, you know, the great thing about working um, at the Skid Row Housing Trust as a project manager at, at this point, I'm 25, is that I got tremendous responsibility to oversee actual projects as the lead project manager, $10 million, $15 million projects, in a way that if I had started in the private sector, nobody would have given a a know-nothing 25-year-old actual responsibility. But when you're making $30,000 a year and you're working for a nonprofit, um, you can get a lot more responsibility. So, so how do you leave Skid Row and go to Venice? So I was at, I was at Skid Row for, for four years, um, and the Skid Row Housing Trust was primarily renovating SROs. And after doing it for four years, I felt I had had a good understanding of uh, renovating SROs. We also did some new construction. Um, and it, these are very complicated projects that involve city and state subsidies, federal tax credits. Uh, I got married, and on my honeymoon, I thought, I, I, said, I said on my honeymoon, I want to get a new car and a new job. And I came back and I <laughs> sold my one used car and bought another used car, and I uh, decided it was time to move on. And I went to Venice Community Housing Corporation as the housing director sort of a bump up in status, even though I don't think anybody worked for me. I was the housing director without much of a staff. My staff and, and was, then I think... They, then you learned how people in Venice didn't want to have affordable housing, is what you said to me. Uh, much more so in Venice than in Skid Row, there was a uh, homeowner constituency of, uh, of well-meaning homeowners scared out of their minds by the gang violence that had happened in, um, in Venice. Um, and who didn't want more affordable housing and didn't trust us to manage the housing, didn't, manage, didn't trust us to screen the tenants. And so I spent a lot of time working on the entitlements to get these projects approved to try and talk these people um, down from the ledge or not <laughs> from, I guess I was on the ledge, um, and getting these projects approved. And it was, it, it was, both nonprofit jobs were great experiences in terms of understanding real estate, understanding real estate finance. So now you tell me it's what, 1994, it's the Northridge earthquake. Stacy Kramer, who, another real Kramer, okay, Stacy Kramer from Pittsburgh. No who, connection to the Lubavitcher uh, Rebbe. No, no com com uh, connection. From Pittsburgh, who had gone to Michigan, moves and she meets David Kramer. You're married. Stacy Kramer, who's a, um, a writer uh, for movies and books. At the time, uh, she was the, a producer. She was a producer. Uh, you and Stacy Kramer say, Forget this this earthquake. We're leaving. And what do you do? You you sell your furniture, you sell everything, and you go cross country. Right. We um I I had been thinking about moving back to New York. Um You returned to Mecca, as I said to you. <laughs> yeah, because I was only going for a year for a Coro fellowship. And um Stacy was much more reluctant to leave LA and the film industry until we were awoken at four AM with the Northridge earthquake and it was very scary and very loud and uh, really freaked out most of Los Angeles at the time. So that's when we began to plot our move. Okay, let's, let's move to New York, and we're about to turn 30, um, and let's um, really make a break of things. We will sell our furniture, we'll hire a uh, storage locker in, on the East Coast to keep everything else, and we'll go travel the world, and then we'll arrive in New York, and then we'll 
you know, we'll take it from there. Oh, just like the immigrants. So same, I arrived. Same idea, <laughs> as opposed to. Okay. Much like my ancestors, I arrived so, so Kramer, in New York so, at 30. You come back. Homeless. At the, homeless. You come homeless. Penniless. Penniless. And you move to Lincoln Towers in the second bedroom of your mother's apartment. Right. It was a very sexy way to turn 30. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm basically. It's a great a celebration. I'm homeless. I'm jobless. Uh, I, I, I take a, um, a part-time job working in real estate consulting where I was paid by the hour. Oh, well, but that was better because originally you were supposed to be teaching English as a second yes, language. Yes, I, uh, I was going to take a job teaching English as a second language. So, so you get this part-time job at this consulting firm. Hamilton Rabinowitz and Altschuler. And what happens after that? Um, and thank God one of your collegiate friends got, helped you get that job. So Otherwise, the, nothing would have happened. So what happens? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 30. And arriving back in New York, I really didn't have any adult or professional contacts. I had a few friends from high school uh, who I called. And I began the informational interview process uh, while I'm at Hamilton Rabinowitz and Altschuler, trying to find a job, trying to find an apartment, uh, trying to keep my wife sane. Then, then how did these two guys, the, these two wonderful guys, Alan Bell and Bill Flowers, hire you? I mean, the, the socialists. Seems crazy, okay? huh? The socialists over there from California, the Coro, they, at 30, at 31, or you're 30? I'm 30. You're 30, they hire you to be a project manager on the Fillmore East? On the Fillmore East. Well. The Hudson companies. These guys had to be out of their minds. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so your first I, project, now you come back to New York. Let's talk about the projects, the first one. All right. So. They, they hire me, you know, they, they were, because Hudson has done so much affordable housing and are the most active developer with the New York City Housing Partnership, when I show them what I had done as a nonprofit developer, they more than, I think, most private sector developers were able to appreciate um, the skill set I had from being a nonprofit developer and didn't sort of pigeonhole me. We don't me. want to say about the skill set, but let's move <laughs> on. The purported skill set. So, um, so let's talk. The first project is the famed Fillmore the East. The famed Fillmore East um, had been a historic uh, concert hall. It then became the Saint, which was a historic uh, gay nightclub. And then it had been vacant for years. It had lost its grandfather's status as a commercial use in a R7, strictly residential zone. And you built what? And we took it over from Pilevsky. It had been in bankruptcy, Phil Pilevsky, um, who had plans for a movie theater. And we did an 80-20 rental. We did a mixed income rental project, new construction. Providing 20% uh, affordable. 20% affordable. Following affordable. the good concepts of helping the city of New York, 80% market. Next, you go down to what, the Lower East Side? Um, I think the next project we did was in the, the meat market. We did a condo conversion project, right, 345. 345 was 13th Street. We took 150,000 square foot building, uh, converted into um, condo lofts that now have the highest resales of village um, condos um, for that neighborhood. And at that time, we couldn't say meat market, so we said West Village because meat market in had, 1997 had a was a transvestite approach. Yeah, so it was a, on, on, on 13th Street off, uh, off Hudson. Very heavily. And then after that. And we were thinking at that time with that project. Do you think we can sell these lofts for 450 a foot? Because the project doesn't pencil unless we could sell it for 450 a foot, and that you know that was that, that was our concern. The next project, the next project was um, uh, the crossroads. We did a market rate rental. The crossroads is at the crossroads of the Lower East Side and Chinatown on 10 Rutgers Street, right at the uh, the F stop. We did a market rate rental there. Uh, we were partners with uh, Allman Burak, who we got to meet. We ended up doing two projects with them. And so these were all great experiences for me, because I was doing a rental, I was doing a condo, I was so, doing an 80-20. So, so now I think you're 32, and your friend Chris Schlank, who grew up with a collegiate, who had this company, I have no idea how they created this name Savannah, but I, well, that's not part of the reason of our show. They say, Kramer, become a partner at Savannah. What happens then? You go back to, go to Bell and Flower, and they say Fowler, Fowler. Fowler. So I had been at Hudson, and when uh, when I started Hudson, you know, every time anybody would see me, they would say, "How's it going at Hudson? How's Hudson? Do you like Hudson? Are you staying at Hudson?" Um, much like when you're dating somebody, "How's it going with Stoller? Are you dating Stoller?" And I would always say the same thing, which is, "I'm very happy at Hudson. I like Hudson. Um, if I leave Hudson, it would be so I can be a principal." somewhere, because I, I didn't have to be in the for-profit world that long to figure out that, you know, to be a principal was, was, was the better route. <laughs> 
And, uh, and so I had met Chris Schlank and his partners at Savannah, and I, I was talking to them about the 80-20 project we had done. And um, if you haven't done an 80-20 and you're hearing somebody talk about an 80-20, I seem very financially sophisticated because I was talking about tax exempt bonds and, and agencies, and they asked me if I wanted to sort of come join Savannah as, as the fourth partner. And it was very appealing to me as, um, A, because th their offices were in Union Square and our offices were in the Gowanus, and uh, the chance to be a partner in a, in a project. So since I go to we, Bell and Fowler. Since we have to move on, the <laughs> guys say, you know what, he's 32, he's energetic, we'll try. And it's been a great thing. So yes. after that, after they made you a partner, the next project was, what, 23rd Street? Um, the Marais. The Mar tell me about the Marais. The Marais was a ground lease we did with the Mandelbaum family and the Kimmel family. Uh, we were doing a 15-story building um, in West Chelsea that had just recently been rezoned. Our new partners at the time, the related companies, were doing a project right across the street, West Chelsea, and the art gallery scene was really beginning to thrive. And we started doing a rental building when 9-11 happened. And after 9-11, when the rental market really, um, uh, you know, went went south, we looked at the project and thought, you know, this really makes sense. This project could really make sense as a entry-level, first-time home buyer, starter apartment in West Chelsea. We had a lot of studios and one-bedroom apartments. Oh, but will somebody buy in a ground lease? So we, we took the chance. We created a co-op um, project on a ground lease called the Marais, and it was a big success. Then you go to Clinton. And then we did the Clinton, which was another 8020 with Almond Burak on West 48th Street, 110 units. And, you know, with each project, we're, we're getting more of the hang of being, you know, experienced residential developers. Now, now, I and know and throughout this entire period, we're developing Roosevelt Island. Right. And let's get to Roosevelt Island because that's, I mean, what you and your partners are doing in partnership with the uh, related companies is really important. 2,000 residential apartments, building a new infrastructure, new uh, uh, South Town, right? Well, South Town's the Roosevelt Island name. We've redubbed it Riverwalk. But it started in 1996 when the state agency uh, issued an RFQ, Request for Qualifications, to pick a developer to build 2,000 apartments, 2 million square feet in the South Town, because uh, there was a North Town in the, in the general plan for Roosevelt Island. And they ended up marrying two of the finalists for the uh, RFQ, Hudson and Related. And for the last 12 years, we've been joint venture, 50-50 partners, building Riverwalk, nine so, buildings. So let's talk about the first building. I mean, mm -hmm. because the first building, uh, one of the, and you and I were talking about this, and I really feel that you're correct, uh, New York City is the epic center of health care. And part of the biggest problem to keep health care and to keep your doctors and your residents and scientists uh, is a need for housing. Mm -hmm. And what, what's the first building that you build in um, Riverwalk? Basically, we went to the hospitals, starting with Sloan Kettering. I called Mike Gutnick, who's the um, CFO of, of Sloan Kettering, and said, we're building 2,000 units. Do you want any? And within two or three phone calls, we had a handshake to build a 256-unit apartment building for them, building one. And shortly thereafter, we had another handshake with Cornell, while Cornell Medical College, to build 136 units for them. So that's building two. That's building two. So we really stumbled upon tremendous demand by the hospitals on the York Avenue corridor for staff housing, affordable staff housing, to recruit and retain their employees. Then you built the third building. The third building was going to be for Rockefeller University. But that fell through when there was a change in administration and they changed their policies. And at the time, we were heartbroken because we thought Sloan Kettering, Cornell, Rockefeller would be a great way to start. So you found Riverwalk. another school. We didn't. We decided we would do our first condominium there. We were cautiously optimistic that we could sell condominiums in Riverwalk Place, our third building, for $375, $400 a foot. Maybe we started at $350. And by the time we finished selling, we were up to $750, $800 a foot. And we were amazed by the interest by people who live on Roosevelt Island um, and people who came to Roosevelt Island. Our biggest challenge was getting people to Roosevelt Island, to realizing that it's not just a tram, there's the F subway station. That once you're there, you have phenomenal views, great open space, um, great prices. Um, and a great product that Hudson Related has been, you know, has developed over the years. We have a commons with retail. We built a, a sports field with soccer and, and softball. Um, so, so in total, right now, you've built six buildings? We, we just topped out uh, buildings five and six. So, and, and the first and, four and are completed. And then in total, you're going to have nine buildings? Yes, yeah, so we have three more that are So, so now you go pipeline. back to your roots. You go to, back to Brooklyn? And, yes. And you find something called J Condo at 100 J Street. What's J Condo? 
J-Con was probably uh, Hudson's biggest individual project. Um, it's a 33-story uh, development, uh, 267 apartments, 350 car garage, ground floor retail, um, ground up. We finished it last year. Uh, it's basically at this point all sold out, all rented out. We have one corner retail space left to lease. Um, but it was a big, fun, sexy, skyline-changing project that we did in partnership with um, Cara Development which uh, owned the parking lot where we developed the project. And it was great for me because I used to live in Dumbo. I live 10 minutes away now in, in Brooklyn Heights. And it was great to do you know, some more Brooklyn projects. And now we're heavily involved in Brooklyn. So uh, let's go. The, the, now you're involved. OK, we'll, we'll get to the next Brooklyn project in a second, because now you come back to Manhattan and uh, East 12th Street, uh, the site next to the church. What are you doing there? We um, applied to buy air rights from the Cooper Station Post Office on 12th Street and 4th Avenue. They had an idea to build up above their post office. And we said to them, that's crazy. You're not going to be able to build up at the same time that the postal workers are sorting mail 24 hours a day with continuous operations below. Why don't we take your air rights and we'll build behind you? Because there was a church that the archdiocese owned and a rectory. And we thought, we'll build on the rectory site um, and use the air rights from the church, and we use the air rights from the post office. So that was the beginning of a three-year process to figure out how to build a site. Um, and over time, the archdiocese wanted to sell the whole site. They wanted to maximize the value of their uh, And what of, are you building the over there? And we're building a dorm for NYU. How many rooms? 740 um, beds, 26 stories. Uh, we should be done by the end of this year. Uh, and by getting to know NYU, um, we ended up doing a deal with them on one of the Roosevelt Island on. buildings. And, you know, we're, com we're, now, we're comfortable doing Now you're going doing. back to your roots even better. Now you're going to the Gowanus. What are you doing in the Gowanus? Um, we have, uh, you know, one of the few as-of-right projects in the Gowanus. Most you're of building the Gowanus, townhouses there, correct? Yeah, we're building eight townhouses uh, down uh, 180 feet of frontage on 3rd and Bond. Uh, the project doesn't have a name yet. It's 3rd and Bond, but we have a blog and we write about it. Called Hudson Gowanus. Gowanus at Hudson. Gowanus at Hudson? Yeah. Well, you know, I, in one of my blogs, we, si we, we said we like to play with names. How about 3B for Third and Bond? And all of the comments from the posters said, no, Third and Bond, that's, that's how you've been describing it. That should be the name. Bushwick. Next. Bushwick for 50 points. Uh, we're building, we're doing you a conversion. You don't even have that. <laughs> we're doing a conversion of a building that's been vacant above the supermarket since the blackout. And we're converting into condos. Uh, David, we're going to close. Thirty minutes is hard for me to, to tell the <laughs> life. You and Stacy have three adorable children. Tell me their names. Uh, Sadie Madison Kramer Kramer. Sadie, yes. Eli Wilson Kramer Kramer, and Jack Clinton Kramer Kramer. Uh, is there any uh, reason that they have some presidential names in there? Well, uh, since Stacy is a Kramer and I'm a Kramer, we decided on Kramer Kramer early on. And Sadie was going to be in Madison, but she became Sadie Madison. Eli was going to be a Wilson, but then he became Eli Wilson. So I started joking that we had come up with presidential middle names, Madison and Wilson. So five years later, we have our third child, Jack. And I've been saying this for five years, that we have presidential middle names. So we picked a presidential middle name. Jack Clinton. Jack Clinton, Kramer, Kramer. We, we live on Clinton Street. And uh, William Jefferson Clinton's the only president who actually occupied the White House that I ever voted for. David? You may be young, younger than me, uh, but <clears throat> you, your partners, have really done a great amount of work, admiral work, and I really consider you a friend and a builder of New York, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Michael. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from HSH Nord Bank and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Allied Partners, SJP Properties, Murray Hill Properties, Bank of America, Greenberg Traurig LLP. Additional funding is provided by grants from 
Arbor Realty Trust, and Terry's Investment Partners, Athena Group, BRT Realty Trust, Burden LLP, City Habitats, City Investment Fund, Cushman and Wakefield, Eastern Consolidated, Essex Capital Partners, Herbert J. Sims and Company, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Metal Products, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, McSam Hotel Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Moynian Organization, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal & Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sydney Fetner Associates, Sutfin Properties, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, Triangle Services, Whitcoff Group, Extreme Contracting and Deconstruction.